A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Whelan Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Whelan Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT. What's going on with the Interstate 74 Bridge and serving up the best food we have to offer in the cities? It's like watching your own child grow, but for us in the cities, it's a billion dollar bridge that will replace the most heavily traveled route in the cities. The Interstate 74 bridge has been in the planning stages for years and the construction process for months. It's faced controversy and delays, but it's also been a marvel to watch grow. But what's happening right now and what can we expect in the coming months? And joining us is the project manager of the Interstate 74 corridor, George Ryan. We got to always remember it is a corridor. It's not just a bridge. Absolutely. So the corridor is just a little over five and a half miles in length. It includes a lot of, we'll call it land-based construction, as well as two new river bridges. Now, when you walked into this project a while ago, you knew that there was the chance for delays and, and for, for construction issues. You didn't bank on the worst flooding we've seen in decades. Is, is that one of the major components to what has slowed things down? Certainly, yes. The flooding as well as the winter that we had last year and, and the severe cold weather definitely was a huge contributor to the delays on the project. And then, then, of course, we've heard the highly publicized uh, issues involving London construction and whether or not the bridge was buildable or constructible, and that had a lot of people wondering, well, wh what are we doing in the first place? True, and, and what that really meant was is that they anticipated a lesser level of, of need on the structure, so they thought it was going to be a little easier than it's turned out to be. So what has happened since all of that controversy has occurred? I mean, ha have you been able to catch up at all as far as the construction delays are concerned? Well, we're, we're working towards catching up and we've changed some of the staging on land and, and jumped ahead on some of the eastbound land work um, as we work through the structure. We're constantly looking at ways to bring the project back on schedule as much as we can as well as to advance schedule. And what we won't do is we will not compromise safety, we will not compromise quality of the finished product. So those are going to be keystone components of the finished product. And then beyond that, anything's on the table to, to keep the project moving forward as quickly as possible. Now you, were, you had experience down in Peoria with a major construction project, and you've always talked about how this one compares, is that you're working while traffic is still going on. Do you look back and go, what did I get into when you came to the Quad Cities? <laughs> so, you know, I'm excited to be here, and it's, it's a magnificent project. It clear, truly is, and clearly what it has done and will do for the Quad Cities makes me want to be here and be a part of it. Also, I enjoy a challenge, and, and there were a number of challenges in Peoria. There are a number of challenges here. I would say the challenges here are little greater challenges because we're building two brand new river bridges as well as the uh, on the land-based construction. Now you had hoped that the uh, Iowa-bound traffic would have been done by what last fall was the original plan. It, it's delayed by at least half a year at that point. Is that that unusual for a project of this caliber, of this of this magnitude? You know, delays and, and issues coming up on a project of this magnitude are expected. That's what the, myself and the whole team that's working I-74 is here for, is to help minimize those delays. So not unexpected. Um, you know, unfortunate that we couldn't do more to work around it and get the schedule closer to where we were than we are, but, but certainly not unexpected. But you have to admit that uh, you, you've, you've worked the uh, detours, you've worked the local traffic in such a way that there were perhaps some hiccups at the beginning, which were also to be expected, but it has been a relatively smooth diversion of traffic. Right, the, the departments of transportation as well as the whole team working for them are committed to making this as seamless as possible for the Quad Cities and I think we've demonstrated that through various traffic stages and, and working to fine tune those to make them as good as they can be. Let's talk about where you are right now. Uh, the Arch Progress, once again, you're hoping that that'll be done sometime by late spring? You were hoping that the Arch will be closed by spring. Yes, Ten more segments, uh, three cross beams that are needed, so tantalizingly close? Close. 
close. If you look at the gap, the gap's <laughs> getting smaller and smaller, right? And the pieces are less length as we go up, but it, but it becomes critical. And we've said all along that that arch, it's critical that we do the surveys and, and the different analyses that we do as we go, because when we get to the top, we have to be within a certain envelope in order to close it. And we're working towards that, and we're there, and we're going to continue to make sure as we get closer to the top. So how close are you? I mean, you must know to a fraction of an inch how close <laughs> you are by now. Yeah, I don't have that off the top of my head, but we're a lot closer than when we began. <laughs> <laughs> is that something that, uh, I mean, you're, you're measuring it as each piece is installed, Correct, right? correct. So, so each piece has to physically in space be within an envelope of tolerance in up and down as well as side to side. So we work with those, we survey the last piece that went on and then we calculate what we have to do the next piece that goes on and we work through making sure that it stays within tolerance and trying to keep it closer to the middle of the envelope. Because I had heard that about a month ago that it was within, what, a fraction of an inch, like a half inch off. I mean, is, if that is indeed the fact, is that, is that minuscule? Does that mean anything? Well, it does to a certain extent. So there are critical points. For instance, the intermediate strut that was recently put in on the Iowa side of the river versus the intermediate strut we're currently working on putting in on the Illinois side of the river. When we get to that, if there's any difference, and a half inch is very workable, very tolerable, but we have to change those differences because that is a hard strut that's gonna go between the two and you have to align those and they have to pull together. Then the arch from that point back acts more as a rigid frame than two independent pieces. So it's a major milestone to get those together. Then the next major milestone will be getting the the uh, keystone piece or the last piece in, and that's a very precise calculation as well. So everything we do to get to that point is to make sure when we get to those points that we're gonna be able to close the arch within tolerances. What will it be to have the keystone piece put in? I mean, is that gonna be a moment where <laughs> traffic stops? I mean, it, it, like you said, it is a milestone. Will it be marked in some way? Well, I mean, it, the public will see the piece going up and, and see it, and it's going to take some time once it gets hung there to get everything fastened up and aligned and bolted. So the public will definitely know what's going on because you won't see a gap in the arch anymore as, as we do that. So it'll be a huge milestone, I think, for the Quad Cities. It's certainly going to be a huge milestone for those of us that are working on the project. Absolutely. You talked about the, uh, the winter that was uh, a year and a half ago. You, you're talking about the summer of, of Mississippi River flooding. This winter's been milder, um, the river's been higher. A any deadline or any schedule that you have, I, I, I would assume you're factoring in weather now more than you ever did, only because of your experience over the last 13, 14 months. Yes, yeah, so, so weather is a factor that's always included in schedules. Where we get tripped up is when there's excessive amounts of flooding, excessive amounts of cold, excessive amounts of wind. So there are factors in the schedule for weather and you know we have options to try to make schedule up if we have weather that sets us further back. So it depends on how much, but certainly um, you know we, we would prefer. We're we're very happy. We've been very fortunate this winter with the winter we've had. Sounds like we're going to get a little Arctic blast, a short term one here uh, tonight, tomorrow. Typical Midwest, right? And then it'll be back. We're close to spring now, thank goodness. So it doesn't look like we're going to have the kind of winter that we had last year. You got to also be happy with your safety record so far. Oh, absolutely. I mean, I don't want to jinx anything. Thing, but I mean things have gone really really well but that's by design as well that's correct and everything that the contractor does as well as the DOTs and, and any people that are working on behalf of the DOT safety is the top concern for all of us we want everyone to go home at night so walk me through what we can expect in the coming weeks as far as a commuter that's going between the two states uh, what what will we see like through June Okay, so through June, what you're going to see is continued work on the arch. And by the way, today we just poured the last cap on the eastbound piers. So we're done with the caps on all the piers eastbound. So you'll see us continue to work on the arch, get the uh, intermediate strut set in Illinois, and then start setting more pieces of the arch. And we have 10 more pieces to go. So you'll see us progress on those. And it should go fairly quickly until we get to the keystone piece. And that's going to take a little more time. And then as far as routes and rerouting and commuters are yes. concerned, what, what's going to happen on the roads? OK, so at this point in time, uh, pretty recently, we put traffic south of 7th Street in Illinois, uh, the eastbound traffic in the west Eastbound lanes head to head, two lanes in each direction so that we could begin work on some of the eastbound land based work before the river bridge was completed. 
You'll see there's a very good chance uh, this spring in, in uh, Iowa that we'll do the same thing north of the, of the viaduct bridge and then put them back on and keep them on existing I-74. So we would have a crossover and we would run uh, traffic eastbound and the westbound lane, two lanes in each direction so that they can begin some of the work on the eastbound portions in Iowa. We went to a public meeting December 11th of 19 and, and took a con concept to the public where we could finish the work in Illinois irrespective of when the river bridge is complete if we were to detour eastbound I-74 in a similar manner to the detour we've got on westbound right now or Iowa bound. Uh, we're working through those. It's looking favorable at this point, so you may see sometime in the spring or midsummer a, a detour that would put traffic on 19th Street, and we'll have additional signing out at the bypasses to utilize the bypasses. So that's a possibility as well as we move into to uh, spring and into summer. So when we talk about the delays, I mean, we've been really talking about what's going over the river more than anything else. Is, is the land-based construction basically on schedule, or was one so heavily dependent on the other? Well, they're very dependent upon each other, right. but, but the land base in general was on schedule for the westbound land base. The eastbound land base is going to be a little different. I think we can end up pretty close to on schedule in Illinois, and, and depending upon when the, the uh, river bridge opens, we'll see where we can get to on the Iowa eastbound, because right now the plan would be to do half of the eastbound work when we're under the head-to-head uh, -head traffic north of the what we'll call the land viaduct the land bridge in iowa that would take you to illinois and i would be remiss if i didn't ask you about the amenities of the i-74 bridge because it's not just for cars and trucks of course we're talking about the uh, chance for some actual uh, uh, uh bikes or walking i don't want to say trails but an extension of pedestrian traffic on that bridge absolutely it's truly a multimodal structure so it's been designed with a 14-foot multi-use path and that multi-use path connects two robust trails along the riverfront in Moline and Bettendorf. So it truly is a great connection to two great trail systems. Yeah, it's, and, and it's one of those things that for all that it has to do to get from planning to construction, once it's done, it's going to stand for decades, if not century. I mean, are you thinking that all the time during oh, the construction process? Oh, absolutely. And that's why quality is so important to us. Mm -hmm. We said before, our keystone is safety second is quality and we're not going to sacrifice either for schedule so we're going to make sure that when we're done this has been designed to be a hundred plus year bridge with minimal maintenance and we're going to make sure that that's what we deliver when we're done george ryan the project manager for the uh Il i was gonna say illinois the interstate 74 <laughs> corridor Thank you so much for joining us. Thank we you. do appreciate it. We are marching closer to March and the end of the winter season in our area. Laura Adams says there's no reason to have cabin fever right now. She's got some great ideas for you to consider if you're heading out and about. This is Out and About for February 16th to 23rd. Put the fun into fundraising at the 2020 Half Life Martini Shake Off at the River Center February 20th at 5.30. Or join Junior Achievements 2020 Bowlathon at the Bowlmore Lanes in Davenport the 22nd starting at 3. It's time for the 81st Mardi Gras Charity Ball, Havana Hideaway at the Quad Cities Waterfront Convention Center the 22nd at 6. Or join Earth Hour at Western Illinois University Quad Cities on the 19th with speaker Joel Vanderbush from Niobe Zoo. The late night show Improvisational Comedy performs at the Black Box Theater February 22nd at 8. And there's Music, Music, Music with Mexico Beyond Mariachi at Galvin Fine Arts Center the 22nd at 7.30. Bergendorf Hall at Augustana is the place to see the shockingly modern saxophone festival February 21st and 22nd. Or watch the Great River Show Choir Invitational at the Adler the 21st and 22nd. There's the Latin Music Festival with violinist Jesus Florido at Rock Island High February 21st at 7, while the Bucktown Review returns to the Davenport Junior Theater the 21st at 7. Winona Judd and the Big Noise perform at the Rust Belt February 21st. Circuit 21 hosts A Night of Sunshine February 20th starting at 6, and the musical The Wedding Singer takes the stage at the Spotlight Theater through the 22nd. Finally, Quad City Music Guild hold auditions for their three summer shows through the 22nd. For more information, visit wqpt.org. 
Thank you, Laura. Kevin Prasbury wants to be known uh, for his ukulele infused rootsy folk rock music. <laughs> he says he's influenced with a Midwestern sound thanks to artists like Van Morrison, Dim Jim Croce and others. He joined us at Moline's Black Box Theater to share one of his original works. It's Seaside. Here's Kevin Presbury. Meet me down by the seaside We can holler at the moon rise Watch as the tide strolls in well, Maybe it's our time I go with it if it feels right I'm getting the right right by you when you're right by me well let's not lose tonight let's get carried away we'll lift our state of mind well it's the place to be well oh goodness grace I want to see where this takes us Wherever the sky meets the sea We could follow the trade winds And go get lost in the islands We'll go and set our inhibitions free right by you when you're right by me well, let's not lose tonight let's get carried away we'll lift our state of mind well it's the Kevin Presbury with Seaside. He's got some Chicago area tour dates just ahead, but we'll be back in the cities performing at Kilkenny's Pub in downtown Danport just in time for St. Patty's Day, playing with the Flying Buffaloes coming up March 14th. What do you search out when you travel out of town and stay for the night? A comfortable hotel room is near the top of the list, of course. Perhaps something to do, an interesting place or venue. But almost always, it's a great place to get a great meal. And the Cities is trying to showcase its best restaurants starting this Monday and running until the end of the month. It is Restaurant Week. And joining us is the President and CEO of Visit Quad Cities, Dave Harrell. Thanks so much for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Restaurant Week's always been a big deal in the Quad City area, but what really is the point? I mean, we all know our favorite restaurants, and we keep going to the same ones. Well, you know, our culinary experience and that vibe is critical to how we tell our story and build our brand. And it's also important for these small businesses, these restaurant tours, curators, or artists, and trying to try to drive traffic into these restaurants during a critical point in time, being late February, is important. So whatever we can do to promote them, to put them in a position to be successful, is something that Visit Quad Cities wants to do because restaurants are really important from a destination standpoint, tourism, 
our visitor economy, but hopefully for Quad Citizens, it's an opportunity to get people off the couch and into these places and support them. Well, I was going to say, because over the last 20 years, we've seen a boom in, in restaurants. You think of Las Vegas. Las Vegas used to be you gamble and they gave away the food. Right. And now you go to Las Vegas and, and the foodies, the restaurants, right. the chefs, the presentation is, is actually competing against the gambling. Food is a major part of tourism. It is, um, and if you look at markets around the United States, I mean, the people that really understand it and then have figured out how to leverage that are doing really well. And it doesn't always have to be about larger markets um, or markets like, you know, where I'm from, Nashville, that uh, have really capitalized on that, yeah, they've got music, but food has become central to their destination. You're seeing markets um, like Grand Rapids, uh, Michigan. You're seeing markets like Madison, Wisconsin, who are doing incredibly well in this space, even Fargo, North Dakota. So I think a lot of markets are seizing this opportunity. The Quad Cities has a really good product offering. Certainly it's very diverse, but we need to accentuate that even more and tell that story further. Are we seeing the Quad City market actually maturing when it comes to restaurants? I mean, have you noticed it? I know it's only been a short time you've been here, but in the last five years, we've seen chefs, yeah. more and more chefs. Right. Um, I, I've seen, just in my year here, I've seen a huge shift in a trajectory, and that's exciting. I think a lot of people are now, um, they're taking risk, they're, they're taking a chance, they're putting some things into the Quad Cities regional destination, and hopefully they'll be successful. And, and I love that. I think the fact that you've got some small businesses that are willing to take a chance on the Quad Cities and hopefully they'll thrive, but ultimately it's all about the experience, right? When they walk into that restaurant, how do they feel? It's a gathering point, whether it's with friends or family or business relationships. It's something that I think we all gravitate towards too, right? Food. Um, and so if we can celebrate that and take a full week and talk about all of our wonderful restaurants in this community, we're gonna do it. Well, and once again, Restaurant Week starts on Monday. It lasts until March 1st, and 42 restaurants are taking part. So you want people to hit all 42 during that period of seven days. My is goal is to try to hit all 42. <laughs> now, I, I gotta work on the core, There Jim, you go, yeah, yeah. But well, yeah that's, that's next week, that's the week you, after. You know, I, I think if you go to qcrestaurantweek.com or if you go to visitquadcities.com, you're, you're gonna see the whole portfolio of people that are participating this year. Um, you can do lunch, you can do dinner. We've added breakfast this year which we're excited about but it's a real diverse you know group of restaurants that are participating and boy if you can just find one or maybe two you know get out there go have lunch go have dinner get into these small businesses and support them well let's talk about uh, the what restaurants are getting back in fact because you're bringing in Amanda Puck right the last name everyone knows but right. she in her own right is a culinary expert uh, 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 a manager or, or actively involved in a number of um, major restaurants in Chicago right. What do you hope she's bringing to the cities when she comes to visit? So we, um, as you know, we embarked on this destination vision and strategic plan project and we'll unveil it sometime in April and we're very excited about that. And one of the insights that came out of that was our culinary vibe and what that experience looks like is really important not only to visitors but also quad citizens. So we want to move that conversation forward. So not only did we want to have another restaurant week where we're promoting all of our restaurant partners and trying to get traffic, we wanted to do something that would be educational. We wanted to bring in an expert. We wanted to bring in somebody from a larger market who really knows everything about food and she is definitely a foodie expert. So having Amanda come in um, and participate and talk about her experiences, maybe give some tips and some thoughts. And it's not necessarily all about just preparing food, cooking food, presenting food, but it's also the business side of it too, because I think her experience will help those people that are interested in that industry. So we're really excited about her coming in. But it is also a bit about, as you said, presenting food, but but the business model, so to speak, and, mm -hmm. and how you deal with customers. And we are starting to see more of these niche restaurants, right. even in the cities. Yeah, well, I mean, look at, uh, if you look at every market that we have, you know, we, we don't necessarily um, say that we're just five cities in the Quad Cities. Mm. We're really a family of communities within the region. Each, each municipality has something that's, that's new 
and, and different. And we're excited about that. I think the more that we can have that diverse experience base is really gonna help our destination move forward. I mean, if you just look at downtown Davenport, for example, you could go to a taste of Ethiopia, right? A new place down uh, by the by Freight House and by Union Station, or you could be at Half Nelson, or you could be at Armor Gardens, or you could be at Duxa. You, you look at just that, and that's not even within you know a half a mile mm -hmm. in terms of downtown. So I think the fact that we've got different things and being able to deliver that uniqueness and authenticity is something that we want to elevate. I can't let you go without talking about what's going on in the year 2020. Right. I mean, because your job really is to uh, bring people to the Quad City area. I know sports programming is so important, but you have so many events that are going on. Is there anything that you want to highlight, particularly for 2020, that's new? Well, I think the new thing will be this destination vision and strategic plan project. and. We're excited about it, Jim, because I think it's gonna be the right playbook for us moving forward for how we're gonna be competitive, how we're going to do the things that we need to do to get worldwide attention. Um, we're really excited about the Missouri Valley Women's Basketball Tournament coming up here in mid-March. We've got gathering in the green um, this year, again, in mid-March at the River Center with 3,000 uh, folks from all over the world that are gonna be participating. The John you know, Deere with, enthusiasts. With, yeah, mm -hmm. with, with that event. But we've also recently announced some exciting things. So um, we recently announced the PDGA, which is the Professional Disc Golf Association Championship, which is gonna take place in 2021. And then we've got the NAIA Women's Golf Championship in 23 and 24. So we'll have literally four years of NAIA golf, two years of men's championships, two years of women's championships, 600 student athletes in our backyard for four years consecutively. So really excited about that. We're bidding on some NCAA events. We're looking at some um, new music and event uh, festival concepts that we wanna pursue. And then we're continuing to go after those, uh, those businesses and those conventions and those associations that we wanna bring in to the community. So there's a lot happening in 2020 and we're not slowing down. Sports marketing is still so critically yeah. important to the Quad City area. I mean, that has been a real growth area. It is, and I think we've unveiled a new sports tourism strategy. So literally mid-December, uh, we've rolled that out. And so we're gonna begin the process on implementation. We're gonna to put together a master plan for all of our venues on both sides of the river and what that should look like over the next 10 to 15 years as we need to compete more in that space. But sports tourism is a little bit like Teflon, you know, I mean, people still, they, they travel all around the United States. They're crazy about the, their kids participating in sports. And it's a space that I firmly believe that we need to be in and we're gonna to continue to leverage it. Dave Harrell, Visit Quad Cities. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank restaurant you, week once again, starting on Monday and going all week long. Visit your favorite restaurant or better yet, visit a restaurant that you're not so acquainted with. WQPT has a commitment to the military families in the cities and we call it embracing the military. And the Army's Leisure Travel Office is offering a trip to Chicago's Comic Con, the comic and entertainment Expo coming up February 29th. It's $40 per person, open to active military, families, retirees, and civilians. It's a full day, departing the Rock Island Arsenal at 7 in the morning. You can contact the Leisure Travel Office next to the PX in Building 333 for details. On the air, on the radio, on the web, and on your mobile device. Thanks for taking some time to join us as we talk about the issues on the cities. A proud supporter of this program, Riverbend Food Bank's vision is a hunger-free Iowa and Illinois. Wheeland Presley Funeral Home and Crematory has been serving Quad City families since 1889. Wheeland Presley Funeral Homes are located in Rock Island, Milan, and Reynolds and are proud supporters of WQPT.